You're listening to the N2K Space Network. Welcome to T-Minus Deep Space. I'm Alice Carruth, producer of the T-Minus Space Daily Podcast. Deep Space includes extended interviews and bonus content that takes a deeper look into some of the topics we cover on our daily program. In this episode, our host Maria Vamazes spoke to Frank White. We're big fans of Frank's research at N2K, and with the increase in access to space, we think this extended episode is timely. More than 30 years ago, Frank White coined the term the overview effect to describe the cognitive shift that results when reviewing the Earth from space. I'll let Maria and Frank explain more. I read the overview effect when I was in college initially, and I reread it recently in preparation for speaking with you. So I'm, I'm really genuinely thrilled that, to be speaking with you. The reason uh, we have you on the show today is to talk a little bit about the overview effect in relation to not just the increased cadence of spaceflight that's happening, but specifically that increased cadence within commercial spaceflight. There is a lot of discussion that people have, or at least I've heard it over pub drinks and the, the like about, is it going to make a difference when we have people going to space who are not traditional astronauts? And does that even matter, especially in relation to the overview effect? So by all means, please, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. In the early days of doing research on the overview effect, I was mostly talking to people who did not go there to look at the Earth or to have that experience. Going back to the Apollo era, it was the race to the moon. And then increasingly, it was to do science and international cooperation on the ISS. And the astronauts really discovered the overview effect on their own. And that is to say, something happened. I felt different when I came back. Uh, I had a shift in awareness from seeing the Earth from space and in space. Increasingly, as I've looked back at my interviews, they've also had an impact of looking beyond the Earth into the universe. And when I first published the book in 1987, those were the kind of people that I interviewed. And that persisted right up until the most recent edition. And... Now, I've started interviewing the commercial astronauts. And in particular, I do have several interviews with people who've flown on a Blue Origin flight. And there's no um, preference for Blue. That's who I've been able to secure for an interview. I'm anxious to interview Virgin flyers as well. And if you like, I could expand a bit on what's different and what's the same about these flights. From the very beginning, I did not take a rigid scientific approach to the interviews. They are self-reporting. I wanted to have large sample sizes. I think we're up to almost 50 people now, but I did not do a typical large sample size social science study. However, I've always looked at it from a scientific point of view in the sense of we have a hypothesis about this phenomenon, and then the interviews are the data that either confirm or reject what we're thinking. And initially, I wasn't even thinking about astronauts. I was really speculating about people living permanently in outer space, looking back at the Earth and seeing it from a distance. And there were no such people at the time. So I started interviewing astronauts to see if that confirmed my hypothesis that having an overview would make a difference. And in those early interviews, I found that it did but it was not what I expected in terms of space dwellers in that it was 
extraordinary for astronauts to see the Earth that way. I kind of thought it would be ordinary for people who lived permanently off the planet. But when you leave the Earth and go outward, it's a bit of a shock to see the Earth that way. And now to get to the commercial side, we have a lot of differences in what's happening. First of all, not a lot of training for the most part. And secondly, they're going for the experience for the most part. And then they're looking at much shorter flights, suborbital flights, and that's a big difference. So I had people say to me that the commercial astronauts on Blue and Virgin would not experience what I call the overview effect because they'd be too close to the Earth and it would be too brief and it just wasn't going to happen. (laughs) And I thought, well, that makes sense. I hear what you're saying. But if we are going to be good scientists, let's just get some data. And I pointed out, remarkably, the United States only has sent astronauts on two suborbital flights, and that was Alan Shepard and Gus Grissom. So um, Alan Shepard did have a comment about his experience that very strongly indicated that something happened. He said he'd he'd looked at all these pictures, he had prepared himself for the flight, but nobody could be prepared for the view that he saw. And I included that in the book, even though I never interviewed him. Well, that indicated something. But now I've started interviewing Blue Origin astronauts and They are on a remarkably fast flight. It's like 11 to 13 minutes. Yes. (laughs) And uh, you would think it it is too fast. It is is too, uh, too brief and you're not very far from the surface. But then when I talk to them, it seems like something significant does occur for most of them. And many people saw William Shatner. Yes. Yeah. That very famous occurrence. I remember watching that live when it happened. (laughs) When he came out, he was deeply moved. Deeply moved. He was close to tears. It was difficult to articulate what happened. It's been interpreted as a negative experience, but I think that's too simplistic. I think it was powerful And it was something other astronauts have reported in different ways, which is they see how tiny the Earth is against the backdrop of the universe, how fragile it is. They come back with a feeling we've got to do something to protect the environment. And he had gone with an expectation of joy. It was going to be joyful. And for some people, it is joyful, but this sense of fragility and responsibility is something professional astronauts who took longer trips have reported. Another constant is we don't think of astronauts crying. Um, there, There's a famous... Tom Hanks' comment in a film called A League of Their Own. And he says, there's no crying in baseball. (laughs) And people think astronauts don't cry, but they do. And I've talked to professional and commercial astronauts who cry when they see the Earth. They don't know why. They're not sure Uh, Jean-Francois Clairvoy, who is a French astronaut, said he felt a sense of love, and it brought him to tears. He said, I I think it's even more than the beauty of it. And other astronauts have talked about tears coming into their eyes unexpectedly when they first see the Earth. 
And we see this with Shatner, and we see it with other commercial flyers, where they're moved deeply. And one of the things that Shatner talked about was he talked about how you go from the blue sky to the blackness of space really quickly. He said something like, it's like the sheet being ripped off your bed when you wake up. And there's this sudden change. And I've talked to others like Glenn DeVries, who talked about you go from the blue to black and back to blue very quickly. And it appears, at least on Blue Origin, what you would think would be a detriment seems to be a a benefit in terms of how important the experience is because this rapid ascent appears to heighten how people feel. It almost sounds like a relief to return to Earth in that case. Indeed, yeah. And you don't have a lot of time to be weightless. You don't have a lot of time to look out the window at the Earth. But still, it appears to me that people know that in advance, so they're very prepared. I believe that uh, people have begun to realize the time is quite precious. So we really, we have to use it effectively. The emotion doesn't always come during the flight. When I talked to Katia Echezareta, who was sent on a Space for Humanity flight, she talked about after the flight. She was flying home, and she flew over the same region she had seen from outer space, and she started crying right then and there. And she was able to pull herself together. She looked out the window again and started crying again. And it's not that clear, you know, what caused that. But it was definitely connected with the flight, even though it was later. And that that might be a part of how quick a Blue Origin flight would be. And um, Sarah Sabri who also was a Space for Humanity flyer, a citizen astronaut, and the first person from Egypt to go into outer space, had a really interesting comment of the lack of distinction between Earth and space. That's really important. I always, every talk I give, I say... We are in space. We've always been in space. We'll always be in space. And that astronauts don't go into space. They leave the planet. This is hard for people to feel. It's hard for me to feel it because our senses don't tell us that. We just feel like we're on this unmoving, stable platform and... Even though we use the metaphor spaceship Earth, we don't experience being on spaceship Earth. And Sarah, when I interviewed her, I had done a before flight interview with her. And afterward, I said, well, what happened? What changed? And she said that the distinction between Earth and space went away. And she just felt it was all a continuum. Mm. And I was really, really interested in that because in my mind, that is probably the top of my list of what we should get out of space flight is we have this dichotomy between Earth and space, Earth and space. I think it's confusing. And if we came to understand in a way we're all astronauts on spaceship Earth and we need to start thinking like that, it would benefit us on the earth. And that to me is what the commercial space lights are about. A large number of people having the overview effect experience 
will, I believe, produce social change back on the surface. It, it's not just about leaving the earth. And I've always insisted that we're not abandoning the earth. Those of us who are part of the what I call the overview effect movement, we're not abandoning the earth. We can't abandon the earth. Um, we're just expanding into a larger environment, you know. The earth is the center of that. As Jeff Bezos says, it's the best planet. We are on the best planet. We're um, a little biased, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I also think some of the commercial carriers, or many of them, have come to understand that they really need to communicate that, you know, what they're doing is not just to give people a joyride. It's to benefit Earth. And I'm glad they're realizing that because from the very beginning when I was writing the book and realizing what the astronauts were telling me, it struck me, well, this could really be good for the planet that people have this new perspective. How, how long does the paradigm shift or cognitive shift last for, from what you've seen from the commercial astronauts? That it, does it last as long? I don't have any really good information on that because I haven't really had a chance to talk to them uh, retrospectively after they've been back for a while. My guess would be that it's very similar to the professional astronauts. What I think happens is that the experience becomes a memory that like any profound experience, you cannot stay in that state of adrenaline flow and, you know, uh, excitement at what happened. You, you really can't stay there forever. You have to function in the real world. But what I think I would see is over the long term, that memory does have an impact on how the astronauts see the world. And, you know, some of them, this is something that's been talked a lot about quite a bit about the overview effect. Do people really change their lives? And that's a very interesting question. And Nicole Stott has written a book about return to Earth where she's thought about that more. But what I've seen is in the original astronaut corps, we have Edgar Mitchell who came back and started the Institute of Noetic Sciences. And that certainly was a change. Not a change in his interests because he was always interested in consciousness, but he started an organization. And uh, Katya Echezoreta came back and she left her work at NASA, which she could have continued, and decided to start an organization to bring these opportunities to people in Mexico, especially young children. So... We see a range of responses where, for some people, it's a shift in their consciousness, but maybe their everyday life doesn't look dramatically different. And then for other people, it's significantly different. And that's why commercial flight is very interesting. Virgin Galactic has 800 customers lined up. Amazing to think more than double of what we've already had. <laughs> I'm just waiting. If you think about the numbers, let's say 800 people fly. They have this experience, the overview effect. If even a small percentage come back to Earth and do something profoundly valuable for the Earth, that's a huge benefit. And 
I don't think every NASA astronaut has changed their life dramatically or their behavior, but their point of view has changed. And I don't think everybody flying on a commercial flight will come back and start a new organization or get involved in the environmental movement. But another aspect of it is that the people flying early are generally going to have resources to actualize whatever they decide to do. There's been a lot of talk about how, at the moment, these flights are only available at a high cost. But, of course, that's how the airline industry started, too. And, um, you know, it it's not a good business model to keep catering to a high price or to uh, high net worth people. I interviewed Sir Richard Branson for my book, the third edition, and he definitely has the democratization of spaceflight in mind. He wants to bring the price down and give everybody this opportunity. From the overview effect point of view, if we can have a reasonable percentage of people either reinforce something they're already doing or accelerate something they're already doing or or even changing what they're doing in life, I think it's going to be worthwhile. And going back to hypothesis, the hypothesis is that the needed change in attitude on the surface will certainly be enhanced by commercial spaceflight. We'll be back after this. I have the first edition of your book where I think the number was 200 had been to space at that time. And when I reread it recently, I said, wow, we're at over 600. How much has changed since then? And it will be interesting to see once we get to the point where space flight becomes much like air flight is now, where we don't have this self-selecting group of very well-off people who can go, how much the overview effect will persist from maybe folks who are self-selecting to go and if it, uh, it affects people who maybe are taking the experience for granted which is hard for me to imagine right now, but I know maybe not in my lifetime, it it will happen. Uh, And it will be fascinating to see, although again, I may not be there to see it. Um, (laughs) I wanted to get back to the thread about, you were mentioning about uh, the new astronauts. You you had a thought on that, and I wanted to make sure I picked that back up again. Was it about specifically the new astronauts in the commercial space, or was it, are we thinking about the Artemis program, or I just wanted to make sure I went back to that. Well, I was still thinking about the commercial astronauts, I think that they also have a bond as to the professional astronauts. And the professional astronauts created the Association of Space Explorers. And that was pretty radical at the time because it was astronauts and cosmonauts from different countries coming together, even during the waning days of the Cold War. And so... The other aspect of it that could be very important is creating a community of people who've had this experience so that they can support one another in whatever they choose to do afterward. That's going to be really important if we want to use it for social change and benefit. And I know that Virgin in particular has focused pretty heavily on creating a community before the flight, and I'm sure they are hoping to do that after the flight. And I think that will be important because otherwise you're coming back and you've had this profound experience, but nobody around you is going to fully understand it. 
And so... How isolating. Yeah. And it's like any profound experience. We, you know, there's this constant refrain with combat veterans. People will say, you know, my father came back. He didn't want to talk about it. He didn't want to discuss it. I don't know if they didn't want to, but there might have been a feeling that they knew the people they were talking to wouldn't fully understand it. And I believe this is going to be an important aspect of the commercial uh, spaceflight opportunity. The other thing to uh, think about is multiple flights where people will go back. And that's another thing I've picked up from talking to people who've flown already. I'm sure this was true of the professional astronauts too, but wanting to go back. Chris Bosshausen had a really interesting experience on a Blue Origin flight. He told me the whole idea of seeing the earth as the fragile nursery of humanity was very familiar to him. And he's a co-founder of Planet, which is all about imagery of the earth from outer space. But he said that what surprised him was a pull outward into the cosmos, a feeling of wanting to go further. And That was interesting in that it is more like what Apollo astronauts talked about. Because, you know, when you go to the moon, you're much further away from the Earth than when you're in orbit. And that sense of the immensity of the universe and the Earth as a small part of it it is much more a lunar or Apollo-type experience. And yet he had it on this very brief flight and it made him want to return. And uh, Mark and Sharon Hagel are the first married couple to go on a commercial flight, and they're planning to go back. Mm. And I think this has implications for a, a much bigger issue way beyond this immediate question And that's the whole issue of large-scale space migration in the sense that it will be really interesting to see if those who have this initial experience want to experience more of the environment that they've... They really just had a taste of it, you know. Um, Certainly, you would expect a NASA astronaut to say, yeah, I went to the International Space Station. I want to be selected for Artemis or I want to go to Mars. I mean, you expect that. You do. It's true. (laughs) However, what about the commercial flights? Is that going to give people a desire to do more and maybe to uh, help build a new off-world civilization. Hmm. You know, I think the answer is yes. But what's also important about it is that we could really benefit the Earth by expanding our range. This is something that's been talked about since the earliest days. And Gerard K. O'Neill, who's one of my mentors, talked about if we build the O'Neill communities that he talked about, if we move industry off the planet and we reduce population pressure on the earth, the earth could recover environmentally from some of the impact we've had. And it would be really interesting if we find out in the future that these early flights began a movement that's much larger than just space tourism? Is it going to move us from mission to migration? I'm really interested in that. And the Human Space Program, which is uh, the nonprofit that I co-founded, 
our mission is to support the inclusive, sustainable, and ethical evolution of humanity into the solar ecosystem. And that's important because we do support migration of the kind I'm talking about, but not just any kind of migration. It needs to be inclusive, ethical, and sustainable. That's a tall order. However, it gives us two different ways of looking at these flights. One is benefit back on Earth because of a shift in awareness and consciousness and greater environmental awareness. But then perhaps an even bigger benefit to Earth, which would be moving uh, people moving off the planet and going into a, this much larger ecosystem, which is out there. Now, I just want to close that particular part by saying the value system that we take with us has got to be better than the one we have right now. And I know many people are not enthusiastic about spaceflight because they assume that we're going to take the same values off the planet that we've had on the planet. And that is a big issue that we, we really have to resolve. And one other thing I would say is we do need to do good studies of the environmental impact of these commercial flights. Because I know, again, people are concerned about that. And I do believe that spaceflight is a good way to create environmentalists. But we don't want to do it at the expense of the environment. And that's a high priority, I think, is to work on that. Uh, that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, I one thought that I, I often have when I when I think about humanity moving past Earth is, when again, when I read your book, when I, but also when I look at photos taken by astronauts who are on the moon, around the moon, back at Earth. I'm not made of that kind of stuff. I'm not that brave. I admittedly feel fear when I see Earth that far away against the darkness of space. Uh, again, I'm, I would never make a good astronaut. And I do wonder about that feeling of, that I have that visceral feeling of, I need to be tethered to Earth. Like the idea of leaving Earth and going to, you know, it becoming the pale blue dot is, is scary to me. I will, and as I say this as a space enthusiast, it is actually scary to me. And I, I, I wonder, I, I'm going to be so curious to hear the, the Artemis astronauts as they go around the moon and eventually one day land, what their thoughts are looking back at Earth. Probably uh, there's more fear involved in spaceflight than we hear about, I, I think. And I know in talking to the professional astronauts, they don't usually use that term. But they do talk about, well, you've got to be aware of what you're doing. And you've got to be aware that you're sitting on top of a, an explosion. <laughs> yes. and, uh, you know, uh, Jean-Francois Clairvoy told me, you do write notes to your family or make videos. And they are kept until you're either safely in orbit or not. I don't know if the commercial astronauts are doing that, but in my interview with Sharon Hagel, she did tell me about the day before she flew. She didn't have fear so much as just a recognition that she was taking a risk, that the next day she would be taking a risk, and that the planet she was on was beautiful and that uh, she definitely didn't want it to be the last time she saw the earth. And so I believe that everyone, whether they're a commercial astronaut or a professional astronaut, has to have some awareness of what they're doing. And I think you are brave because you admit it. That <laughs> you're afraid. <laughs> and, uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> what we're looking at is the future of the planet, the future of our species. Not everybody needs to go uh, to be part of this. And in fact, 
as you well know, Maria, I mean, you've got two astronauts standing on the moon. There are hundreds and thousands of people on Earth making it possible for them. And every mission, there are many, many people doing that. I mean, even just, I, I was struck, I did a lot of traveling recently, and I was observing what was around me, and I, I thought about that there were a lot of people who don't get much recognition who made it possible for me to go from the Boston area across the country to California, and it was baggage handlers, it was people who cleaned the plane, it was people who uh, checked us in, and of course the pilots and the, the flight attendants. And I thought about how miraculous it really was that we were doing something that we are used to, we're accustomed to, and I do believe eventually that spaceflight will be like that. And yet, I will tell you this along those lines. On one of my trips, the pilot said, you may have noticed that it got quiet in the cabin. That's because one of our engines isn't working. And <laughs> we're going to have to land in Cleveland. <laughs> and I'm sure he sounded very calm. <laughs> <laughs> he was calm. <laughs> Yeah. Nobody panicked. It was pretty clear that they had it under control. We landed in Cleveland. There was a fire truck there waiting for us. And it is somewhat miraculous that for the most part, that doesn't happen because people take care of the engines. And it's it's similar even today. I've been to two launches, two space shuttle launches, and, you know, a lot of people cry at a launch. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. And I think it's because we realize what human beings can accomplish when we work together instead of against one another. And as you point out, we've kind of lost the miraculous feeling of, of airline flight. And going back to something I said at the very beginning, my first idea of what the overview effect would be like was it would be normal. It would be typical. A person living on the moon would look up and there's the earth in the sky and they would be astonished if it were not there. <laughs> We would be astonished if we looked into the sky and the moon wasn't there. And talk about fear, we'd be pretty worried about that. However, <laughs> we're not there yet with spaceflight, but I'll be okay, you know, when we get there. And then we will go further out. And the further out we go, the more our consciousness will change. And we will we will probably become more aware of our place in the solar system and then eventually more aware of our place in the universe. And all of these changes in consciousness are indications of who we are, where we are in the universe, and what we have to offer. And I think that there are many, many benefits to space exploration, but the impact on consciousness of ourselves really needs more attention. When we talk about the shift of humanity becoming a, a spacefaring species, I know that's a, we, we are talking long periods of time. In the short term, when we're talking about the cognitive shift, what can those of us who are space enthusiasts do to share the effects of the overview effect with all of everyone else on terra firma? What, what can I do to be sort of an evangelist for this? Well, we do have some organizations that you're probably well aware of, and I always recommend people get involved. Uh, you know, the Human Space Program is pretty much an all-volunteer group, and we always welcome people to get involved. I'm on the Advisory Council of Space for Humanity, and again, we didn't say much about it, but when you get selected, you have to agree to come back 
and do something in alignment with the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals. I would also say another uh, aspect of it is Space Renaissance International, led by Adriana Otino, is leading a coalition of groups to convince the United Nations to make space an 18th goal. We're arguing that without space migration and space science and space development, the other goals are going to be more difficult to achieve. We haven't even talked about the analog astronaut movement, where, you know, people are going into habitats and environments where they simulate being off the planet for a week, six weeks, six months, or longer. Now, you could get involved in that without leaving. (laughs) You know, while we're talking about it, uh, I would say one last thing is virtual reality. That's an area you could get involved in, or any of your listeners. Virtual reality is a way of creating the overview effect experience without leaving and without the cost and uh, other implications of sending people into orbit or on a suborbital hop. And uh, yeah, and then don't forget, now this might be less scary. There are also (laughs) several companies using stratospheric balloons to take people higher, uh, space perspective, worldview, and so on. And um, so there are going to be a lot of ways to be involved, and you don't have to go to the moon, (laughs) and uh, you don't have to risk your life uh, to do it. The other thing I, I did want to mention, just to, you know, case closed on these suborbital flights, Dylan Taylor is my publisher, friend, benefactor, and uh, I interviewed Dylan before and after his suborbital flight, and he, in the post-flight interview, which was a few hours after he came back, he said, I'm paraphrasing, he said, this discussion of can you experience the overview effect on a suborbital flight I'm here to tell you 100% yes. So I think we're engaged in a great, exciting experiment in social change. And, uh, you know, probably the most important thing, and you could help with this because you have a podcast, is to communicate to the general public the benefits to planet Earth of what we're talking about. And it's not all rocket science, and it's not all aerospace companies and the Defense Department and the particular entities they usually associate with space. It's this social movement that's really aimed at improving life on Earth. And that's the real message of the overview effect. That's it for T-minus Deep Space for July 1st, 2023. We'd love to know what you think of this podcast. You can email us at space at n2k.com or submit the survey in the show notes. Your feedback ensures we deliver the information that keeps you a step ahead in the rapidly changing space industry. This episode was mixed by Elliot Peltzman and Trey Hester with original music and sound designed by Elliot Peltzman. Our executive producer is Brandon Carr. Our chief intelligence officer is Eric Tillman. Our host is Maria Vermazes, and I'm Alice Carruth. Thanks for listening. <laughs>